Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, draft registration. Is it unfair to young women not to force them to kill and die for weapons profits? Our guest, Rivera Sun, is the editor of Nonviolence News, a nationwide trainer in strategy for nonviolent movements, and the author of many books and novels, including the terrific The Dandelion Insurrection and The Way Between. She serves on the advisory boards of World Beyond War and the Backbone Campaign. Her essays on nonviolence are syndicated by Peace Voice and published in hundreds of journals. Rivera Sun, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me on the show, David. Thanks for coming on. I forgot to say your website is riverasun.com, and I, I was just thinking of the Backbone campaign, seeing these paper mache heads of the G7 leaders in Europe all over the, the news. Unfortunately, they didn't have the, the prison outfits that the Bush Cheney chain gang used to have, which communicated a message, uh, not just a photo op, right? Those were the, the best props ever seen, I think. Yeah, Backbone does some amazing artful activism and has actually uh, inspired many uh, imitators, which is great. They love to see that, uh, and but they are an original for sure. I, I I wish we'd kept it going through the subsequent presidencies, the <laughs> the characters, the 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 criminals running the U.S. government. We sort of dropped that after. Bush well, and you know, left. when it comes to war crimes, they they could all wear the stripes for sure. They, they can. We didn't. We just needed to change the heads. Um, so so draft registration. Why is Congress even they, they, they got nothing better to do than to try to expand draft registration to women? Uh, yeah, I ask myself that same question all the time. But actually, um, the the court system mandated that the Congress needed to appoint need to do something about expanding equalizing gender in the draft system after they opened up all the military positions to women um, in the Obama uh, era, they also need to deal with the fact that we only draft men. And so how Congress decided to do, deal with this was to appoint a two-year commission to go around and study it and hear, you know, very staged public comments from people who wanted to draft women, basically. Uh, it was supposed to be open to the public, but we found anti-war feminists had a very hard time being heard. Young people had a very hard time being heard. Uh, There's a lot of uh, typical sort of masking and concealing of what was going on. It was hard to get to the hearings. But at, long story short, by the end of this commission, they recommended to Congress that they expand draft registration to women. And now Congress has actually two bills before them, one that one that actually calls for the abolition of the select, Selective Service for Everyone. And you can imagine, given my background, which one of those bills I think is the right way to go. I mean, a number of countries have been getting rid of mandatory year military service and draft registration and the possibility of a draft uh, in the future. Uh, I mean, we aren't talking about a draft, right? We're just talking about draft registration, and the draft hasn't been used for for decades. Uh, is I mean, is this something that feminists see as a feminist step forward to sign up young women to be forced against their will to go and kill and die for whatever the wars are for? I think it depends on what kind of a feminist you ask. Um, there are certainly pro-war feminists or people who say they're feminists and are pro-war. I have a very difficult time conceiving of how war is particularly and children. It has negative outcomes for every feminist goal that you might be able to articulate. Um, you know, we certainly saw pro-war feminists on the draft commission, the commission that was studying the draft expansion. They're championing the expansion. But, you know, people are confused. We want to talk about equal access to serving in the military. We've got that already. If you are a woman and you want to go fly fighter jets, you can do it now. 
a draft is an involuntary conscription. It's basically another form of slavery. It's saying you and everyone who's of your age need to come and work for the military. You don't have a choice about it. And to me, it is not an advancement for anyone to expand an injustice that currently applies to men to women as well. As an anti-war feminist, we argue that it is not an advancement for feminist e feminism either to simply continue to have women ex excluded from the draft while men have to go. Feminists have always stood up for gender equality for men, women, and people defining gender differently. And so that's why we are calling for the abolition of the Selective Service for all genders. Do you, do you think people misunderstand and imagine that you have to get signed up if you're going to be allowed to take part in a war when there is a war? I mean, I think you can poll the U.S. public and most people will tell you there isn't any war and hasn't been any war for decades. They just don't exist in their understanding. Uh, and, and I think like something like 45% of the U.S. public says that they would participate in a war. Well, what does that mean? What's preventing them? Why can they not find the recruiting office down the street? You know, because they're all over the place. So, I mean, do you think people imagine that at some point there might be a war or there might be a war they approve of, unlike all these wars they don't want to think about too much because they're so hideously awful and criminal? Or do you think that that's how people are thinking of it as, as, as voluntary participation in a better war? <laughs> Uh, probably. It's hard for, me, hard for me to imagine what's going on in their heads. But um, what I have run into in the course of opposing the, the military draft for all genders is a lot of fantasy thinking. And, and it's strange to say that, but, you know, the conversations with people around the draft is like, what if we we're invaded from both sides, from Mexico and Canada, and suddenly we all need to go to the front and we need all hands on deck? And to me, this is, you know, what I mean by fantasy thinking. It's like, how likely is that scenario to happen? And what are all the thousands and millions of things we could be doing to prevent that scenario from happening besides expanding the military draft, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't quite know what goes on in people's heads when they're thinking about, you know, when should I go and serve? How should I serve? When when is it time for me to do my military duty or why wouldn't I be a peace activist and prevent that from happening? You know, if you're, if you're concerned about security in this country, you should join war beyond war and stop the wars. <laughs> It'd be a much safer and, and more appropriate strategy in my opinion. Yeah. It sounds delusional ground wars and fronts. I, I mean, this is stuff from world war two propaganda. This is not what wars don't have. <laughs> Wars don't happen on the ground and don't have fronts. This is, you know, this is This mythical, was a question that was literally asked, literally asked to me uh, by the, the commission when I proposed that they end the, uh, the abolish the selective service. This is the kind of like scenario thinking they're putting their heads through. Yeah. It, so let me ask you from a different perspective, Rivera Sun, uh, because you talk with people who want to end war and you know that a lot of them think that the draft is some sort of an anti-war tool, that if we want to end wars, we got to have a draft. It's the only way to get people to oppose the wars. Uh, what do you say to that? Uh, I don't know if I want to dignify it with the term argument, but, but what do you say to that thinking? You know, have you ever seen West Wing back in the day? It used to be on television. Mm, for better or worse, yes, I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that argument got really popularized through an episode of West Wing. And the problem with popular popularization of arguments like that is that we just kind of sit there to stop wars. You know, it's a great way to get racial equity in, in military service, but it's not. That is not how drafts play out. It hasn't been the way that they play out um, historically. We know that the privileged in our society can get themselves out of serving senators kids are getting drafted right yeah um and so you know what we have seen is that while we associate the draft with ending the vietnam war that hasn't held true for other wars in which there have been long the war 
uh, and any scenario that we could think about, they raise the human cost of that war, right? So as peace activists, for us to imagine that, oh, to keep the draft, because if they ever enacted it, it would help us stop a war, is saying, oh, I accept that 30,000 young people will, ha will go and die, and that is an acceptable strategy for ending a war. That's not okay with me as a peace activist. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more, except, well, maybe I could agree, agree even more than what you said, and that is to note that, you know, the, 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 the number of, of people who would die from the, the aggressor side, from the U.S. side, doesn't begin to compare with those who die on the other side. And the last time there was a draft, there were perhaps six million dead bodies at the end. Uh, I, I mean, if you put all of the names on that Vietnam Memorial in Washington— it would go all the way up and down the National Mall, not just that little piece where it is. Uh, and so I, 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 I read and I really shudder at this idea that people have that you should let the wars get so bad. We haven't had, outside of maybe the Congo, we haven't had a single war that bad uh, as the war on Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia since then. Uh, and, and so to, to let the wars get that bad in order to have a, a certain kind of, of anti-war activism doesn't seem like anti-war activism to me. Well, that's what I mean, David. People need to be a little bit more rigorous with their argument, arguments, their critical analysis, the way that they're thinking through these issues. I run into this a lot on this issue when we think that gender equality can be somehow served by equally conscripting people into the military. That's a little bit like saying, you know, oh, well, slavery was bad, so maybe we should have enslaved more Native Americans to equal the number of black people, that African Americans that we were enslaving. Or maybe we should have enslaved white people, too, and that would be okay. Um, you know, we need to really be critical. And then the other thing we need to do on this issue and so many issues, particularly around peace, is to stop compromising, right? To stop going for an easy out solution. Um, yeah. But to say, you know, what is right in this situation is to get rid of this system. We have a bipartisan bill before Congress to abolish the selective service. And people across the aisle from where I stand are against the selective service because of civil liberty infringements, which I would agree with, because of wasting government mm -hmm. money, which, yeah, you know, I think we could definitely use the $24 million a year they spend on maintaining an inaccurate database that doesn't actually work that well on something else. Um, you know, and so people should know that there is an option. We could abolish it. That would, that would certainly meet the goals of gender equality, and it is the best way to meet those goals. And then this is a bill introduced by U.S. Congressman Pete DeFazio, is that right? And, that, and people can call and email and write and visit their Congress members? Absolutely. And if they go to worldbeyondwar.org slash repeal, they can find out all about it and they can click on that to uh, send a message to their congresspersons. Um, you can also find out a lot more about the issue. It's a great database resource of, of what's going on, why we're talking about it, uh, what you can do about it. So I thought, Rivera, son, I thought the U.S. Supreme Court was going to have to take up this matter and decide it one way or the other, unless Congress came along and overruled them somehow. Uh, but they seem to have just punted. We, they, we just won't, we won't deal with this issue. Somebody else handle it. Uh, could Congress just do the same, and could everyone just muddle along with the unconstitutional, unfair mail draft registration uh, for, you know, the foreseeable future? It's a little convoluted, but uh, the, it's an option that's slightly on their table. They, they were under a mandate at one point from the court system to do something about it. That got backed off a little bit. If the, if the Supreme Court hears it, hears the case, then they'll they may order Congress to do something. It's a little hot potato. Nobody wants to be the person who's going to draft your daughters, right? right. Uh, there's a pretty, uh, you know, it's a funny little equation. We're only talking about this because the men's rights group movement got the ACLU to have a really strange stance of backing their claim to, um, you know, have their rights infringed upon. And we're only dealing with it this way because Congress are chickens and they don't want to abolish the selective service. 
and the Supreme Court doesn't want to come down and be like, yeah, this is a really unjust system that's equitable, that's, you know, equivalent to uh, another form of slavery. And we had that argument hundreds of years ago and we need to stop it. So nobody wants to be, nobody wants to do anything with it, which is how peace activists uh, are the ones who ended up handling it. <laughs> and, and Congress set up a commission with a predetermined outcome so they could say, we're going to do what the commission told us. But, but the ACLU, I mean, didn't these guys get started with the abuses of World War I and the, the wartime abuses, the, the crackdowns on people who dissented from World War I, and now they're going to protect men's rights not to be abused by draft registration, not by opposing draft registration for men, but by supporting draft registration for women, as if that somehow helps the men. It's bizarre thinking. I wish, you know, if anyone out there listening has connections with the ACLU, I think you should tell them that. I think it's a, a ridiculous stance for them to take. Again, it's another example of this, like, short-sighted thinking that you know, they have this pretty impressive legacy of helping um, people resist the draft, men who have been conscripted resist. Um, and now they have some strange argument. They're thinking of themselves as the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the moment on this issue, where they're going to use a men's rights issue to work for gender equality. But we're not talking about getting a social security check as a primary care provider, which is what Ginsburg got her breakthrough on. We're talking about not actually doing anything to help men and actually conscripting half of the populace into going and fighting and dying in wars, in addition to enabling and empowering the war hawks among us to think that they have an endless, I call it the cannon fodder credit card, right? They, they just want to use our young people's bodies as an excuse to plan to wage bigger and bigger and more costly wars. And I think that's a terrible idea. Yeah. And they talk about the U.S. military talks about wanting the draft to enable them to plan the kind of wars they want without ever a single mention of how they're going to empower the peace movement. I haven't heard that once out of the Pentagon. Imagine what the peace movement could do with just $24 million a year, <laughs> <laughs> well, which we is could what end. they spend on maintaining the draft system. Which, you know, even the, the former head of the Selective Service said that the, the current draft system is outmoded and, and ineffectual, um, you know, that it's not, it's not working currently. You know, expanding more people into the system is actually a waste of money. Yeah. Does, doesn't even work on its own terms, like the rest of the war system, uh, where our guest is Rivera Sun, who is the editor of Nonviolence News. She's a nationwide trainer in strategy and nonviolent movements and the author of a number of terrific books, uh, including novels, uh, incredible works of fiction, but related to activism, The Dandelion Insurrection, The Way Between... Uh, and many others. Rivera Sun, you're kind enough uh, not only to be on the advisory board for World Beyond War, but to be planning to do a, an online book club uh, discussing one of your books with, uh, well, anyone who wants to take part, but uh, it's uh, for the benefit of World Beyond War. Uh, can you tell us about that book club? Absolutely. So uh, World Beyond War has been running They've all been amazing authors, and they've all been uh, nonfiction writers, uh, but this is the first time we're looking at a work of fiction, and I'm very honored. Uh, but the series that I, I've been writing has to do with taking the genre of young people's fantasy, so young adults or even younger teen fantasy. They love the courage, they love the creativity, they love the adventure. But if you have kids or if you scan the bookshelves uh, in the library or in a bookstore, you might have noticed that a lot of these stories hinge on the heroes proving their valor in the midst of war or the young heroine picking up the sword and chopping off the fantasy genre that they're trying to do with the military draft. You know, we're seeing the... the um, the rays of Star Wars, we're seeing the Hunger Game heroines, we're seeing Wonder Womans, and it's a, 
it's not a secret that the U.S. military and Hollywood have a very tight relationship, but we need to be women in violent militarized positions and it has a direct correlation to the propaganda they're rolling out to get us to accept things like the military draft. So in the novel, I turn that genre on its head and I say we don't need the war in violence. Girl, learning what we call the way between, which is an Aikido-like non-martial art, and um, the skills of peace building and nonviolence and the things that we can tangibly replace war with. And so we'll be reading the book over four Wednesdays. Discussing here today, but also, you know, why, what is it that makes kids obsessively read this series? Because that's the best part is kids love these books. They'll go into the backyard and play the way between instead of Star Wars. Yeah. And, and, so, and so adults or kids can sign up for the book club and then they read the book, a quarter of the book or so, and then discuss it with you? Absolutely. Yes. And uh, we'll, you can bring your questions. You can bring your curiosities. I'll bring up topics, too, and we'll explore them together. It's a, a nice time to, to dig into why, you know, why these lack of them but also what happens to our culture when they're present in our, in our own reading habits, in our kids' reading habits. You know, when a, kids have an idea that, you know, they can prove themselves worthy in dramatic and adventurous option that's typically on the table of your kids' uh, reading habits right now. It, absolutely. Uh, and, and when kids read books or when parents read books to kids, uh, almost inevitably, uh, the kids will reenact them. They'll, they'll imitate them. They'll do what was in the book, uh, especially whatever was the most exciting or worst part of the book. And, and so you've actually uh, seen or heard about kids reenacting peacemaking rather than fighting and war and killing uh, after after reading this book, right? Uh, they like I said, they will act out the scenes in the backyard. They'll write their fan fiction stories. They'll dress up as the characters for Halloween. There's something about the the books that is capturing their imaginations in very powerful ways. And what I've heard from young people, because I got to zoom with a number of classrooms who have been reading. affirm in young people what they already know. A lot of young children, 11, 12, 13, they already know that violence hurts. They know that war is bad, right? But nobody be working for it. Uh, you should be looking critically at the wars that are going on. The people who, work, who go to war suffer from it. You know, with young kids, 10, 11, 12, I mean, those who come from military families know the cost of that. They have uncles and, fa and fathers and increasingly mothers from PTSD, family members who might have died overseas. And so to affirm to a young person that a hero isn't the person who wins a war, but the person who stops a war is an incredibly powerful thing. And, and what age range are the books, that's the series that starts with The Way Between, in terms of someone reading it to you or reading it yourself, what ages uh, are they best for? Yeah, the heroine uh, <coughs> begins at age 11, rather like the Harry Potter series. So if your kid likes Harry Potter, they're probably ready for this book. I've heard of parents reading it with younger kids, with young The funny thing is that I wrote them for kids, but apparently it doesn't really matter what age you are. I hear <clears throat> that a lot of grandparents and parents will order the books and need to give them to the kids right away, but they'll start reading. And then those kids won't get them quite so fast because the parents want to read them first. Um, you know, I've heard of veterans 
speak here is the tears that affirm what we know as human beings to be right and true. So, yeah, yeah anybody can read them. Well, I will be reading them to, to my kids. Well, maybe getting my older son to read them and reading them to my younger son. Uh, and I myself read uh, Dandelion Insurrection, which was just... Uh, which was just uh, I think uh, terrific for for adults. Um, I don't know if it was ma it meant for adults, but it uh, it worked for me. Absolutely, Dandelion Insurrection and the subsequent part of that parts of that trilogy are definitely meant for teenagers on up to adults. Yeah, um, you mentioned the Harry Potter series, Rivera Sun, and it's extremely popular, and most of it is very good and kind and nice uh, and. The, the early books in that series have less horrific violence and hatred than the later books, but it, the whole thing seems built around this idea that there are just inherently evil people, or wizards as the case may be, and good ones. And the good ones have the job of, uh, of fighting and killing the bad ones. Uh, and there are enemies and even kids in the school there is a kid named Malfoy who is the enemy of the kid named Harry and uh, if kids read this stuff they think the real world is like that don't they yeah i mean and i mean to his credit harry potter does do a lot around the the prohibition against uh, murder right it's very uh, mor murder and torture uh, are two of the um, forbidden curses to use. Um, and so I, I think that it has some really good points in there, but uh, again, it does build up into this massive war between the Death Eaters and the, you know, Harry's schoolmates and teachers. And, um, right. you know, it certainly doesn't uh, advance some of the things that we know are very valid and um, effective in conflict resolution. And so in the Ariara series, that's definitely something I'm, I'm trying to work towards. And honestly, it's a little challenging to um, make it believable. It's almost more believable to have magic where you can fly across the sky than yeah. to try to teach our war culture that there's a whole other way possible. But it, it is a really great challenge because when you can successfully do that, you can just see the light bulbs going off in people's minds, that they, they really recognize that you know, when we go to war, it's because we have ignored a thousand other choices along the way. We have really chosen that choice um, rather than rolled that back, walked that back, or thought even for a moment that if we stopped that war and tried to resolve the causes of that war in another way, we wouldn't have to kill each other <laughs> to do that. How wonderful would it be if everyone grew up knowing that? Uh, we have been speaking with Rivera Sun. Her website is riverasun.com uh, to sign up for her book club uh, that's happening in the month of July. You can go to worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, Rivera is the author of books including The Way Between and The Dandelion Insurrection. Rivera Sun, thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. This has been a, a great episode, and you do so many great episodes with really wonderful people doing excellent work. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.